Welcome to today's broadcast of the N Generation Project Podcast, showcasing daily excellence with this episode titled, Have Knowledge and Comprehension in Christ. Join us as we read into what Michael from the Council of Time has to share with us tonight. For deeper insights, visit the official Council of Time website linked in description. Join our mission of disseminating God's word and also carry a message of recovery for our people still suffering with addiction. Your support drives our mission and unlocks the transformative potential of living a meaningful life of truth and sobriety and prepare for what the Bible calls perilous times. Be prepared. If you enjoy these videos, we have a brand new locals community and also have lots more information on that in the description. In short, we get to run a full-time channel with the help of our beloved subscribers. See the link in the description. But now, before we get into today's rebroadcast podcast, titled, Have Knowledge and Comprehension in Christ, Episode 49, we wish you a heartfelt thank you for your unwavering support. As we journey together, we're committed to maintaining this podcast ad-free. Your backing enables us to share God's word far and wide. Remember to subscribe, like, and message us for daily excellence in your life. Just those simple acts help get the message out and across the world where we have our podcast translated into over a dozen languages. And now, it's time for today's rebroadcast podcast number 49. Have knowledge and comprehension in Christ. Blessings to all. Good morning, early morning to many of you out there. Morning to you. All right, guys, this is our... In that hour, here Monday, it's already Monday. Can you believe that? Well, in most places, it's Monday. But we're talking about bondage tonight, right? One of the most unpopular aspects of bondage is the type that nobody can see. The type that uh, plagues people many nights of their lives. But we know that wisdom and knowledge Grace from our Lord can actually free a person from that bondage. But there are some principles we have to know of. Because suppose you ask a request of the Most High of something. He already has a principle behind. For example, if you were to ask to be released from a specific trial, but it was the Lord's process to have us in that trial. Do you think he would release you? In most cases, he does not. We have to ride out that trial because it produces things. But there are other topics and subjects that a lot of people pray for, but they're not free from. They have nothing to do with tangible things. Everything to do with an intrusion from the spirit realm, it would seem. And it disturbs people. People are, in fact, hurt, fatigued. Lots of people are fatigued when they find themselves in this scenario, situation. And so in that case, it's very important to note that God put us here for each other. For example, how does the Lord supply your provision? He does that through mankind. He already said he already wrote how he would do that, right? Given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaded together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? He already gave us the avenue by which he does supply us and bless us in many cases. So what about the people who have spiritual duress? What about the folks who continue to have these nightly dreams, experiences, and it's starting to affect their lives and their days. And they don't know how to stop it. Sometimes you can rebuke things in a dream and nothing happens. Some people have known that to be true. Freedom begins with having knowledge of our Father. Having knowledge of His ways. Liberty begins by actually being in Christ. 
Many claim to be in Christ, but they're telltale signs of one who is in Christ. They have liberty. They have peace. Right? They're not compromised by many different things. So how does a person get there? How does a person get to where they are now with all these experiences, right? Thoughts that fragment your mind. Sometimes you're thinking about the Word of God, but you cannot help but to think about those experiences you've had in your life. And when they are not defined, right, we start guessing, searching, trying to find some type answer, which can, in fact, lead us away from where we want to go. And, of course, these things continue. The breaking of those types of experiences, or any spiritual experience, begins with wisdom, with knowledge, and the understanding of Christ. You have to know who you are. And all that, to have that wisdom, that knowledge, all those things, there's something else that has to be addressed. You have to know what you want out of life. You'd be surpri surprised to know how many people don't know what they want out of life. You'd be shocked to know that many Christians, they'll say they want to be saved and pleasing unto the Lord. But that is an actual result of their life. What do they want out of life? Because here it is. When you don't know what you want out of life, you end up asking for everything, and you go in a thousand directions. You never really stay with one direction. You start going with anything that will promote or talks about what you desire from life. But we're not talking about what you desire or what you feel you want. We're talking about what do you want. Sometimes I feel like I need a break. But that's not what I want in life. I don't want to break. Sometimes you feel you need some rest. But I don't want the rest. I would like to have answers. Right? I would like to have joy and peace restored. I would like to experience the fullness of God's word. I would like to know that everything Christ said will become an aspect of my life. I would like to have, like that, like freedom, liberty. And that's when you know what you want out of life. Because if you know what you want out of life, then you have a prayer that can address what you want. So here's a test. Whatever you want out of life, could you ask your father for it right now and never move from that for the rest of your days? Yes or no? Or would your wants change? Would they be altered? Would they be different? Hmm? Sometimes. Sometimes we're willing to compromise too much. Because we want peace. Sometimes. Not all times. Sometimes. Hmm. Tonight, we're going to address, we're going to start this, this, this topic, this series is on bondage. We're going to start this, but it, it does begin with some unpopular issues, which keep people bound and full of fear, right? It does. It begins with an identification of the issue itself. Can we know that most bondage is of the mind? You may have a circumstance, but you interpret that circumstance with your mind. As a consequence, you start feeling in a specific way based on those circumstances. Right? So once we address the issues, one of those issues is going to be your exit from anger for final time to identify what you want out of life 
and to see the deceit from the three unclean spirits. By understanding the narrative, that deceives. Those three unclean spirits are a big issue in the time that we live in. Big issue. Hmm? Huge. That's what we're going to discuss. All right. I see that question down there. I used to have lots of dreams of people dying when it happened. I was called a witch, so I asked God to take my dreams away. I've not had them anymore, but I feel like it was a gift. Do you think God is hurt because I don't want what I was, what was given? No. If we knew, the person says they used to have dreams. They saw people dying. Other people told her to basically rebuke the dream. They thought she was a witch. So she has gone to remove the dreams. And does she think that uh, God is hurt by her request of removing the dreams, right? If, in fact, they turn out to be some sort of a gift, right? No. No, no. Here, here's the deal. If we understood the fullness of our dreams, we would not ponder them. We know exactly what they are, right? When you ask the Father to remove anything from your life, should that be a good thing? It's because we didn't know. Much like a child, right, does not comprehend the importance of education. So do we not. We don't comprehend many things in life. Not yet, right? Not yet. Your father's not upset of that, right? If he were going to be upset, it would be because one of us has perished outside of him. Other than that, no, he's not disappointed or anything else. We misidentify many things in life. And as far as your gifts are concerned, God doesn't take your gifts away. Right? They don't all they just go to somebody else because you will not use them. That's not the way that works. You are made a specific way. Your gifts are like your lungs and your kidneys and your stomach and everything else. Could you live without your kidneys and your stomach and your heart and your brain? No. Those are essential organs. Correct? So you have gifts that are essential to your spirit. God's not going to remove them. You just haven't discovered the fullness of all of them. Once you discover the fullness of what you do have, your decision, right, then will be a real decision. But from, from this point Right? At this point, because we don't have a full understanding, it really is much like a child rejecting food. You know, they're hungry. They have to eat. They have to be nourished. But they reject food. They say, no, I don't want that right now. Right? They reject medicine. They don't want that either. And medicine that works does not taste good. Nothing. Right? Doesn't taste good. Many people have had a sneak peek into things just like that, dreams of future happenings of the condition of this world, right? Everybody is so full of gifts. All you guys have a gift. You have a set of gifts. Let me give you an example of that. When somebody's watching you, how is it that you can turn around and look them right in the eye? How is it that you can feel someone watching you? There's no technology involved. Right? No trickery involved. Right? No anything involved. Yet, you can feel someone looking at you. Now, this implies there's a lot more to all of you than you think. But the, here's the main issue. The main issue is these gifts are not categorized. If you don't know you have them, you won't utilize them. And if you don't utilize them, you'll be more inclined to disbelieve they exist in the first place. But all of you have a set of gifts. And feeling someone watching you, right? That's not the gift itself. That's only a portion of the ability that exists or coexists with a specific gift. That means right now you have enough gifts to not only defeat Satan and his minions, but to actually blot out the world and walk on top of the world. Directly to the finish line. Do you know that? You have that ability right now. And if you ask, why won't it rise? Because you don't believe you have that ability. And you will not ever use it. 
right? Gifts are not something you can buy. It's not something you earn. It's not. It's something that's always been a part of you. You may utilize certain gifts and not know it. You'll chalk it up to coincidence or give somebody else credit because you don't yet understand the fullness of that gift and how things work. It's kind of like this alien narrative, right? Most people think that aliens came from out there. You already know the story. The problem is the connection between the old world and this one has been broken. And there are lots of things hid. Do you not know that the UFO topic has, is largely in the eyes of so many something it's not? It's being utilized by darkness itself to cover up what the truth is. When people run away with a theory, they allow people to keep that theory going so that they will never find out the truth. Because if they found out the truth, and this is why the truth is so dangerous, if they found out the truth, they would be led back to something like the Book of Enoch. Right? And if they're led back to that book, they're going to believe the narrative as to what these Nephilim were after, what Satan is after. And if that were to ever happen, people would depart from all evil, run into the arms of the Messiah, because they would have had the truth proven to them. But of course, you know, we walk by faith. But can people still have that truth? Yes, they can. But who would go forward? Because if you speak a narrative not popular in the ears of everybody around you, you will be excommunicated, deemed a nut job, crazy, pushed away. One of the biggest fears of Christians is to be pushed away by those they open up to. That's a big fear, which is why most Christians will not open up because they have a tender spot, right? When they trust or when they love someone they trust and overlove, they overtrust. And when that trust and love is betrayed, it hurts them a thousand times greater than with anybody else. So a lot of Christians conduct what's called a cover-up of what they really are. <clears throat> But tonight, we go into a topic to begin to break that and to expose the cover-up. More and more. We'll do that. More and more. Having identified the issues, right, bondage from entities, which is exiting anger, identify what you want out of life. Identify the deceit from the three unclean spirits. Right? You need some explanations. Why me? Anybody ever say that? Why me? Why is this happening to me? Some people who have accepted Christ still believe that they are special from creatures from another planet. They still believe that they're picked from some set of entities for a special cause at the end. All of that is part of the guise of the three unclean spirits. You need not that anybody tell you that you're special. The testament of how special you are is that you exist today. You have not been taken down by anything, which means nothing on heaven, nothing in the heavens, nothing on earth, nothing beneath the earth has been able to take you out to this very moment, which means there's a power with you and an authority with you that's greater than all the world. And you live and breathe by it every single day. Yet, many of you have been convinced not to walk within the power and the authority that's within you, but to walk by fear. Fear of the consequences of what may happen at any time. Fear of entities that by way of tricks invade your life and intimidate you. Fear in a myriad of subjects. Once you know and have these explanations, right? Well, you can start your journey. A true journey in freedom now requires 
that the individual that all of you listening to me tonight, if you're one of those wrapped up in bondage, spiritual attacks, you don't know which way to turn your story is a bit much for the average Christian. I want you guys to know that you're not by yourselves. No matter how crazy anybody thinks your story is, spiritual bondage is a very real thing. We're not here to deny it, nor to follow ways that somebody has, uh, you know, the steps of freedom, but to simply have you identify in the company of those brothers and sisters that go through the exact same thing you do to identify what that darkness actually is. Once you identify it, you know what to ask for. But if you can't identify it, it will continue to work. Some of you have been going through this for years. And you didn't tell anybody to this very day. Many people don't know what you're going through. You've tried to classify it. But have you noticed? Have you noticed something? Anybody who's going through this, these spiritual bouts, right? And it spans many different uh, areas of life. Anybody who's going through this, you are, it's almost like you're instantly motivated on very specific topics that you should not be highly motivated by. But a lot of that is discernment. Knowing who you are will allow you, right, the freedom to operate within the anointing God has put in your life. Do you know what happens to a person that works outside or what they're designed to work in? They find themselves trying to play catch-up. You're always catching up. You feel like you're always behind the curb. Do you know what happens when you operate within your anointing? You never play catch-up. You never do. You're never behind anybody's timeline. You become a well of very fresh, spiritual, good water. And the Lord sows within you overwhelmingly what you must speak to everybody else. That means some of you, you have to go dig to find out what the Lord would want. When you operate within your anointing, you have too much. And you don't know where to start. Not only that, because you're in that area you were made to be in. You have maximum compassion in that area, which means nobody can challenge you caused you not to remain in that area. No matter how much they hate you, it doesn't matter. You will remain in that area. And that area, by the way, will perfectly align with Christ. Always. It'll always do that. So tonight, again, we're going to begin to address this issue of bondage. And it really begins with the identification of what you want out of life. And seeing what those three unclean spirits are doing, right? So, if you don't mind, let's, let's do something real quick. We're going to go to the Bible. Because we have to, uh, we have to look up these three unclean spirits, right? We're going to go to the Bible and find out what in the world have these things been up to. By the word of God. we got to find out. Because there certainly is an element working in your life against the good that you would attempt to do. The apostles also knew about these. They knew about them. And they wrote about them. They never wrote that they were coming. They wrote that they had already been within mankind corrupting things, right? Really corrupting things. And so we're going to read about them. Revelation 20. We'll start in verse 7. No. Let's not start in verse 7. Not verse 7. We're going to go back. Going to go back. Going to go back. Let me get this right here, guys. Oh, here we go. We found it. But hold on. Let me save this so it stays. The three unclean spirits, right? Many of you have heard this so many times before, where they came from and what they're doing. But we need to clarify, right? We need to clarify exactly what they're doing. So turn to Revelation uh, 16. And we're going to start in verse 11. No, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial 
upon the seat of the beast. Seat of the, where is the seat of the beast, everybody? The seat of the beast has already been prepared for him. It's that position of the beast. The seat is the position of the beast, like the position of a president, the position of a senator, the position of this person, that person. It is a predefined position, right? So he poured out his vial upon the great uh, uh, upon the um, great river Euphrates. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea of the beast. I'm going to put that one short. And the sixth angel, this is Revelation 16, 12, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, right? And the water was dried up, and the ways of the king of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. This is Revelation 16, 13. So as he's pouring out these vials of wrath, is what they are. He names, John starts naming these three unclean spirits and what they're doing. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Well, if it came out of the mouth of the dragon, who is that old serpent, the devil, if it came out of his mouth, out of his mouth, remember what the Lord said. It's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out. So what is he talking about? If it came out of his mouth, words, doctrines, philosophies, words, words, words. Listen, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. And it says they look like frogs. Interesting. That's interesting. Because do you know how many civilizations around the world or troubled by upright lizards. Maybe you don't know that one yet, but we'll certainly cover it. Three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Where were they? They were in the false prophet. They were in the beast. They were in Satan himself. Why would Satan be possessed by one of the three unclean spirits. Because that's a double whammy. How can what was once a covering cherub be infested by something else? Now, in times past, I used the word possessed because it's very easy to translate. Meaning, right? Meaning that it's easier for a person to understand that somebody's been taken over by something and whatever they speak and whatever they do is influenced by what took over then to go then to tell you what I'm about to tell you. What I'm about to tell you is based on principle. Again, the Lord said, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out. The apostle spoke of the same thing. For the apostle said he can eat anything. Right? And he encouraged other disciples, when you go into a town that eats pork, then you eat pork too, not to be the offense in that town or to offend those at the table. You are permitted to do what they do. So he's talking about eating, but never once do you hear about food coming up from someone. You do hear about demonic entities being cast out of someone. In this case, one of those three unclean spirits came out of the mouth of specifically the mouth of the dragon. Now, the dragon is spiritual. So if it comes out of a spiritual mouth, we know their words. Remember the harm of the first beast? A mouth was given to him, and he spoke great things and blasphemies. Remember that? He spoke great things. He spoke things that were just rotten and blasphemies. So he boasted, right? This thing boasted, this thing bragged, this thing held an audience, it, it, you know, by people who heard him. So this thing was, uh, that, that mouth given to him was pretty damaging, right? It's very damaging. And he wore out the saints of the most time. All right, so we know that too. That was with the first beast, Right? Revelation 13, 6, and he opened, and he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in the heavens. 
right? So he opened his mouth, and that's what happened. He was given a mouth, right, Revelation 13, 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So a mouth was given to him. But it says one of the three unclean spirits came out of his mouth. Now what's given to the first beast, that mouth, the same mouth that spoke, it spoke lies, irreparable lies, theories, all sorts of things to get people to do what? To do what? Well, it says here, Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of devils. They are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So how does, how, how can the first beast, the false prophet, and the dragon have a unclean spirit in their mouth, which in fact is a bunch of devils, right? By the words they speak, by their communication, by what they are communicating, right? Words are extremely dangerous sometimes, but words are how we express ourselves and our intent. It is how we transfer our understanding to another by words. In this case, the beast is communicating to his people things in the kingdom of the beast. He also does miraculous things in front of them. But in Revelation, you can see they made an image to the first beast, so he won them over. In the book of Daniel, he overcame them by flatteries. He scattered among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches. He did what his fathers were not able to do. To win somebody over by flatteries is to tell them exactly what they want to hear. And when you do that, people can follow you because you have told them something favorable to what they want to do themselves. So in this case, the three unclean spirits are a bunch of devils who have been speaking through the, through the Lucifer, through the beast, through the false prophet. Now, does anybody in Revelation see the dragon talking to people? Do you see that ever? No, you don't. You don't ever see that, do you? You never see Satan speaking to anybody. Why is that? Because he gave the beast his power, seeing great authority. But there's something you have to know. Before the beast was... People worshipped the dragon. Before the beast existed, people worshipped the dragon. How do they worship something they did not see? The father speaks against something. Consistently, he speaks against it. It's when men worship the works of their own hands. Uh-oh. When men regard the works of men, they find themselves at fault for the most high. Revelation, it says, they continue to do this, even after almost utterly being destroyed, and they did not repent. They did not repent of their iniquity of the worshiping of gold, it says, and of silver, and of wood, and of brass. They worshipped this stuff. How so? They placed it above everything in their lives. They murdered for it. They lied for it. They stole for it. They coveted it, right? They damaged lives by it. They did everything you can imagine to obtain it, and they did everything you can imagine to magnify it. When you magnify something, you're in worship to that thing. And they magnify gold and silver. And things of gold and silver and of wood and of stone and of everything else, they magnify it. Look at Las Vegas. 
Democrats. They brag on what they have built. Look at New York. They brag on what they have built. Look at everything out there in the world. And men hold up what they have made. They even have people worshiping the Constitution, don't they? Think about it. Do they not have people in worship to the Constitution? See, I can say that, but if a person is offended by that, weren't they in worship to the Constitution? Think about that. That's a word, that's like a treasonous, blasphemous statement to the world. If you tell somebody, did you worship, or are you worship the, worshiping the Constitution? You can get someone instantly angry. But they'll never do that to Christ. You put down the Constitution. This world will decapitate you, but they won't do that about Christ. So it tells you who they're in worship to. You can speak against money and they will crucify you for doing so. But they won't do that with the Lord's things. They won't. Well, they. So they worship all this stuff. They worship it. And the three unclean spirits in the dragon, the one that was in the dragon was speaking the same thing that was in the beast. So people did worship the dragon by worshiping all these things the dragon influenced. This is before the beast comes. Men worshipped the dragon. Rome did. Rome put their own doctrine, their own ways, their own things above everybody else's. Everything was secondary to Rome. Babylon. Everything was secondary to Babylon. Both King Nebuchadnezzar and King Darius, they couldn't help themselves. They did so. So men worship the works of their own hands. And these three unclean spirits are constantly giving man ideas to create things that they end up worshiping. Right? They do it all the time. They give men doctrines. Now, I'm going to talk about one. So what I'm telling you is this. These three unclean spirits are constantly feeding humanity some sort of narrative, telling them some sort of story, having them conduct themselves in some sort of way. And they are orchestrating it to do what, though? To do what? Their final goal, the final goal is to get the kings of the earth and the whole world to cause them to gather to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. He continues and he says, and he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So, every narrative, what is that like the Jews? You ever hear that word Zion? You can be stoned to death here in America by speaking that word Zion by way of vocabulary. You have to walk a fine line. In this world, you have to walk a fine line. You may think you can go out there and speak truth. You cannot. Because if you spoke the truth, it's going to be unfavorable to the world. The Lord already told us. If you love the world, you don't love the Father. If you, the, anybody who loves this world, the love of God is not in them. And they have enmity between them and God. Angry separation. God does not magnify any kingdom in the earth. His word does not magnify any kingdom in the earth. The problem is, the world is such that if you, you can't go out there and say what I just said. You cannot. You cannot say to the average person that somehow you can't say, listen, God did not write the Constitution. You can't say that. They get angry. People get angry. 
out of sorts. Because the world has taken the way of Cain anyway. Through doctrines, through policies, through the construction and the framework of these kingdoms. People hate Jerusalem. People hate Israel. Of all things on earth, with all the racism, why is it that all nations combine with their hatred with the populace in those nations who really do hate the Jews? Some of the people don't, they don't know what a Jew looks like, yet they hate the Jews. They hate them. Why? It's the doctrine of these three unclean spirits. They didn't begin yesterday. They've been doing this over thousands of years, I do believe. Because it became out of the mouth of the dragon. At what point was it put in the mouth of the dragon? By Satan's influence. Even in the Bible, much evil has been done in these kingdoms. Consistently causing people to hate Israel. Who do you think started these faith doctrines in the world other than Christianity? Who do you think started Islam? Who do you think started Buddhism? This is where I have to fill you in. Take, for example, the Sumerian tales. One of the more popular ones, right? The writings of Thoth or Tot from Egypt. More and more Christians are involving themselves in reading these things. And as a consequence, when a Christian reads these documents, it causes them to start redefining the Holy Word of God, or they will question big parts of the Holy Word of God, or they try to make them inclusive in the Holy Word of God, don't they? Hmm? Don't they? Don't they? It causes people to do a host of things. And in so doing, they end up mistrusting Israel. So if a person comes around and, and they start talking about hating the Jews, the Christian may not speak up against them. May not. The Egyptian tablets, silver book, gold book, all those different books. They have things near and close to the Bible. Bitter. But it's not the word of God. How many people interpret this writings of Zechariah Sinchin and say, well, this stuff, this is what the Bible is based on. Hmm? This is what the Bible is based on. Have you ever heard that before? Anybody ever hear that? So let's bring out the truth, though. Have you ever noticed when a person is talking about Zachariah Ascension and they begin to talk about the Word of God, they get angry at the Word of God? Have you ever noticed that? They'll talk about Zachariah Ascension, N.K., Enlil, all those different figures. But when it comes to the Bible and they say, well, this is where the Bible came from, they'll start cursing. They'll start getting angry. They'll say it in these vicious tones, won't they? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? Same thing with tote or thought. Same thing. They get angry, hostile. As though they're saying on the inside, how dare anybody say the Bible is true over this doctrine in their reading Zechariah's Ascension? or they're reading the, the tablets of Tote, or they're reading the Egyptian book of the dead, or they're reading some other book. They get angry when you talk about the Bible. They get vicious when you start talking about the living God. Haven't you noticed that? You think that's a coincidence? And of what spirit is that? What spirit is that? That would cause a person to get upset with Jesus of Nazareth. 
when they start looking into these doctrines. I'll tell you why. It's a spirit. Satan's spirit is embedded in everything he did. So that if a person begins to operate by the doctrine of Satan, they're no longer a friend of the Messiah. That's why. See, because the Lord told us. Any, he said, try the spirit by the spirit. And, and make sure that that spirit has acknowledged that Jesus came in the flesh. Well, guess what? Zechariah's sentence by no means acknowledge that. Tote by no means acknowledges that. All these other religions will not acknowledge that. So the Lord is telling us what spirit they're not of. They're not of the Father's spirit. Hmm? They're not of the Father's spirit. I had a friend of mine, we were going, to, I told you guys, I read the Quran, and when, when we caught ourselves reading the Quran, Right? We cut ourselves while we were in the Quran. But the same, we had the exact same question at the exact same time. And we both said, I wonder how many Christians really think Jesus is just a prophet. And we looked at each other like, what in the world was that? And while we chuckled at the whole thing, we grimaced at the thought of those who love the Lord, who would then read those books and not be strong enough to withstand the spirits that come with the readings and the doctrine of that book. When a person has read, and if, and listen, when a person is not fully covered and they have read all that stuff, they are fragmented and torn so bad. All they can do is question everything of Christ. And they end up questioning everything of the Father. They do. They cannot make heads or tails of anything of faith. Because as soon as you get your mind into one of those books, anybody who's out there who has read those books, anytime you get your mind in those books, you lose your spiritual insight. It's almost though the New Testament is full of gibberish. It should really reveal. It should really reveal what spirit is over those books. Now that's just a book. What about a topic? A topic or a theory or a proposed topic is the same as reading. There are many people into this alien stuff. They're not fully covered. That's why if they go too deep, they drift away from the word of God. I can't see you guys, right? There are certain times when the wrong spirit will begin to operate in people. And it will prompt them It gives it signature every time it does that. These spirits have a signature. Do you not know they ask the same questions all the time? They never go outside of a certain set of questions. That's how I, I can identify them. But here's how it happens. It means that when a person is interested in another topic, the question is, you got to ask yourself, what are you actually looking for? What are you really looking for? So you can have a desire within and feel a desire, but if it's left without a category, you're going to start trying to fill that desire with everything. And while you're doing that, you could potentially destroy your spiritual insight. Many Christians have gone through that. They have. And they barely made it. In fact, if it were not for Christ, 
they know they would not have come back. So we have to clarify something. Because these doctrines and these things put into the world clearly are not of the spirit of the living God. If they were, if they were, they would confess Jesus came in the flesh, but they don't confess that. They deny that openly. They deny that Jesus came in the flesh. They deny it. They deny it. They deny it. Don't they? That's why always let the Lord lead you into what areas you go into. You have to be covered. Anybody who has gone on their own to read this stuff, you understand how dangerous it can be. Have you ever noticed that when you're into certain subjects like this, but they're not actually the Bible, how that you can go back to the New Testament and it seems like the wording, the wording in the New Testament becomes a little too much for you to instantly comprehend. It's almost like your brain aligns to a brand new way of thinking. And when you go back to the New Testament, not the old, but the New Testament, what Jesus is doing makes no sense. Surely, many have noticed that. Surely many have noticed the spiritual blindness that goes with these other doctrines. That's the consequence. Now, what happens? What would have happened if the Lord didn't bring you back? You would have been one of those who believed in Christ, but then are fully taken over by something else. And then you would have been one of those who blasphemed the living God, Christ and his tabernacle. All those people you read about Revelation who blaspheme God because of everything happening to them, they know the prophecies. Well, wait a minute. How do they know these prophecies if their brains are stuck in other doctrines because they were once believers like you? And they were drawn away. They were drawn away. Drawn away. Isn't that something? Thrown away. Thrown away. Those entities. Those entities. Are constantly at work altering people's minds. Constantly. And all because of this spiritual spiritual binds, people being in bondage spiritually, and the world does not answer those questions. So they're forced to go out on their own to find it. Even their fellow Christians are not addressing their issue. Christians will not talk about the UFO subject, will they? They won't talk about abduction. They won't talk about spiritual invasions at night. They won't discuss those things. They won't do it. And in fact, they should be the spiritual authority on all of it, but they won't discuss those things. They'll look at you funny if you tell them. They'll look at you strange if you tell them. These three unclean spirits have been at work. And they will be at work with the beast when it's fully completed. And they will be at work with the Antichrist. And they will do an expedient work to get people to assemble themselves because in all of what they're saying, they're drawing people down to a place called Armageddon. That means, how do you draw everybody down to Armageddon? It's posturing. 
making them truly believe the narrative of the world right now. Russia's fight with Ukraine. Does it really have merit? No, not with spiritual eyes. It does not. Owning the Ukraine is not going to change the identity nor solve the problems of Russia. We always think we have to have this additional thing to solve our problems. Russia is doing no less. That is by order of Putin. It's doing the same thing. We really think that in America, if we close the border, it's going to be so happy in America. That's not true. It's not true. We always think things like that. We do. We think that somehow if we pass the right policies, then everybody's going to be happy. That's not true. Have you guys noticed the spiritual principle of this life? There's a principle in effect always. First of all, can anybody obtain a paradise here in this world? Yes or no? Can anybody have their paradise here in this world? You know what the answer is? No. It means if you get one thing fixed in your life, God already promised you a certain level of weight in your life. This life is to raise you, and no child can ever grow up and mature if you give them everything they want. They will never mature. Do you know that? You know what makes us grow? You know what makes us learn? Let me give you the process. It's real simple. You have a person running a stop sign every morning. They do so for 39 years. People are telling this individual, hey, running that stop sign, you're going to hurt somebody in this, that, and the other. They hear it every other day. And in their minds, they say, yeah, but it's not going to happen to me. And then one day, they run a stop sign. They hit a school bus full of kids. And all the children are injured. It's that moment when that person hits that school bus and he's dragged before the courts and they sentence him to 13 years in jail. It's that moment the person hears what everybody says and it becomes real. It is that moment when the words take root. That's when the person truly believes it. See, you can hear something, you can learn about something, you can walk right in something, and does not mean you believe it. And if you don't believe it, they're just words. It takes something to have you believe it. When things go wrong, in those moments, in those situations, that's when you realize, oops, this is real. When you thought you would never be in a specific situation, you never looked at events that would lead up to it or anything that would free a person from it because you said, nope, that's not me. It'll never happen to me. And then when it happened to you, you said, Lord, please help me because I cannot free myself. I'm in trouble. As a consequence, when you say I'm in trouble, I cannot free myself. You tried everything you know how to do to get out of that problem. And when it doesn't work, that's when you realize, wait a minute, this is a real problem. I should have. And then you start saying to yourself, I should have never did this. I shouldn't have done this. I should have listened over here. I shouldn't have touched that. Well, it's too late. But is it? Of course not, because your problem is orchestrated by the living God, and it just so happens you're only tried in areas that will cause you to lose your soul. Do you know that? God's not going to put you in some crisis moment unless it's for your deliverance, which means if he does not do it, you will not be delivered, which means if he does not put you in it, and the temp turned all the way up. You'll never make it into eternity. You'll never do it. All your problems, all your problems are orchestrated. 
Why? If you love the Lord. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Didn't he? Huh? Why do you think the apostle said, don't think it's strange when you find yourself in fiery trials? Isn't that what he said? He said, don't think it's strange. Stop thinking that's some kind of weird thing. Don't think that. So what does that mean? That means even when you do it, you're growing by it. Everything God does, he does with high purpose. We may see it as useless, meaningless. We certainly don't like it. I can look in hindsight in everything that has happened in my life and see the truth of it. Somebody asked me one time, a long time ago, and I told COT about this. They were talking about, well, they said they were abused as a child. This person was angry, and I said, the reason you're angry is because you cannot see your father in that act. Well, how can you say the father's involved in that? Of course he is. Two months later, I told the person. Because the same person had an issue. The same issue with their child. And you know what I said? I said, because of you, that child cannot be touched. That's only because of you. And you have that attitude and that eye only because you were touched. Because you were touched. You said, that's not going to happen to my child. And you watched him like a hawk. And you knew every spirit that came close. What if, you, what if that person had not gone through anything? then the generational curse would have continued. The generational curse would have continued. And it's never broken until someone goes first. Someone has to be broken first. In our case, Christ died so that we didn't have to. In your case, you're going to go through things so somebody else does not have to. There's a child right now, probably, right now, praying, God, send someone to help me. They're scared to death. And the generational curse would have continued. And it's never broken until someone goes first. Someone has to be broken first. In our case, Christ died so that we didn't have to. In your case, you're going to go through things. So somebody else does not have to. There's a child right now, probably right now, praying, God, send someone to help me. They're scared to death. And their uncle is coming. Now, who can hear the cry of that child? Save the father. Hmm? What about the cry of your children? And you hear their cries? Now you know why you went through what you went through. There was a person in COT that was right after we had this long topic, about a month after. This person was in a public area, but this time they acted on what the Lord put in them. They saw someone young. They just went up to the person and asked to get the person, you know, buy the little person a drink or something like that. And one of those little frozen things or something. Even the parents said, sure. Eating that little thing, this person was moved to tell the child, don't worry, help us here now. The child burst out in tears. The parents get upset. The person had already called. 911, as per the spirit, and when the cops show up, the girl had bruises all over her body. If, if that person had never gone through anything when they were young, that little girl's life would have been a living AG double hockey sticks. Do you know that? That's gut-wrenching to even think. Children are walking around bruised up, but nobody can see it. 
because they're wearing clothes. Let me tell you something. That person who interceded in that child's life by direction of the father would not have been able to do that unless they went through the same thing because they would have told the father no. See, when the Lord leads you to somebody and he does, if he leads you to a person who's sitting on a park bench, he says, go get that person, whatever you have in your wallet, instantly. Is that the Lord talking to me? That can't be. The, you'll sit there and debate. You'll pass a person. Anybody ever pass a person on the street? In your heart, you wanted to give the person something. And, of course, it's going to be at the most inopportune time. But then you question, is that from the Lord? And you keep driving, and it, you're really thinking about it. And then you have to put it out of your mind because a moment passed, only to think about that later. And then you say, what do you end up saying? I should have given it to that person anyway, but it's too late. Now, let me tell you something. If a person was homeless, and they struggled like that, and nobody ever came, and at the age of 60, they become a Christian, after living on the streets for 40 years, all of a sudden they're blessed and they're driving around. That person, if that person got an unction by the Spirit, they would stop in the middle of traffic. They'd find a way to get to that person, and they would never let that moment pass. And they would get out and give that person everything in their wallet. Do you know why? Because they went through it themselves. Listen, you got to go through something to have the compassion behind it. God can move you all day. It does not mean you're going to act on it. But for those who have gone through it, their compassion level rises up and it defeats every voice in their head. And they plow through everything to be obedient in that area. You have to go through something for that. If you don't go through something like that, You'll never have that motivational com uh, compassion to do it. You won't have the proper motivation. You'll have the thought of doing something right, but you won't get up and do it. For the person who went through it, they connect with it. And nothing on earth nor in the heavens can stop them from rendering aid to that person they have their eyes on. Because they can see everything about that person. Why? Because by looking at that person, they see themselves. They would rather die than to not help that person. You have to go through something for that. You will not respond to everything in your life, but you will respond to those things you have gone through. Oh, yeah, you most certainly will. That means your life is not cursed. It's just that we don't have a fullness and an understanding in the preparations of the Father or person with a truly blessed life. See how that works? You're not cursed. You're blessed. You're not abandoned. You're fortified. Hmm? You're fortified. You're not going to collapse at that time of the calling. You're going to be like an iron rod. They cannot be moved. You're going to do exactly what the Father called you to do. And there is no force that can stop you. Ironically, many people who have gone through things like that, they blame themselves. They blame the other person. They listen to the narrative of darkness. They grow bitter, cold, heartless, stuck, introverted, and they can't get free. It's time to be free. It's time for people to see what has actually happened, what has happened, what the Lord decreed to happen, operating in truth. The 
Lord knows exactly what he's doing. And everything he does is for the benefit of his children. So, that brings up a point. That means, given the time that we live in right now, some of you, spiritually, you've been given the notice. You know what the notice is spiritually? Oh, it's almost time to go to work. You know, you know, somehow you know it's almost your time that you've been preserved for this time. And it's almost your time. You already know that. You know it. Somehow you know it. Now that the time is here, that's when people start getting nervous. Because they know this one. Well, this ain't. This is not the fake time. Right? This is real deal. That's why it's time for people to be free all the way. And in order to do that, it's time to really define what elements been working in your life, how they've been working in your life, and how to shut the door right in their faces. Because do you not know, do you, do you not understand? God has given you authority. Over all darkness. Do you know that? Not some of it. All of it. But you'll never utilize it. If you don't know it's there. Or. Or. If you're on the wrong side. If I ever stand. In darkness and agree with it. I cannot rebuke that darkness. I cannot rebuke that darkness when I stand with it. So it's time to find you. We have to find out where we're at. You have to find out if you're in darkness or you're in the light. And we're going to do that right after the break. I'll be right back. Right here at COT. All right, that's the way. Right there. All right, I'm back, you guys. Where do you stand? Well, you have to answer this question. You ready? What do you desire the most? Can you guys name to yourselves what you want out of life? Can you name that? You know what happens when you name what you want out of life? Your motivation is set. You can begin to work on that, right? Suppose, suppose, Someone in life simply wants to make a big impact on God's people right? or their own family or their kids or something like that. You have a starting point. But suppose somebody in truth wants wealth. Listen to me. Whatever you desire in life, whatever you want this life to be, you will begin to gather or collect everything. It goes with it. In your case, if you're a Christian, you have to do it by principles of the Lord. For example, if you love the Lord, the world hates you. If the world hates you, don't expect it to favor you. Expect your father to favor you, right? Not the world. Not the world. That means when the world throws these little tricky things on you, don't get upset. Realize, realize where you are. Let your motivation be single. In other words, let your motivation be from a starting point. It's not going to shift every other day. You're a Christian, a believer in Christ. What would a normal, what would the average Christ-believing Christian want out of life? Well, if they believe in Christ, they also believe in what's coming. They also understand what has been. And for that case, they're not looking to be a king in the world, so to speak. But they are looking to have what the Lord said they can have. Right? Jesus said, I give you my peace. He said, I give you my peace. Now, can the peace of Christ, can we define that? The answer is no, we cannot. Not until you have obtained it. And if he said, I give you my peace, then what peace did Jesus have? 
what peace did he have? What comprehension of peace did Christ have? Well, I'll tell you something in his walk. He had absolute faith in the Most High, didn't he? So he rested in the understanding that God is God. He never questioned that. He exercised authority. So he knew the Father could do all things. Which means he could obtain all things, but he came for a specific reason. Correct? A specific reason. So what was his life about? To fulfill his purpose in the earth. Listen, for every Christian out there, God has predestined you. But if you want what you want, how can you be predestined? Uh oh, see, here we go. Somebody said, I thought I was going to like this one, but I... I do not. If you want to be what you want to be, how can you become what God has predestined you to be? How many of you believe that Christ will do exactly what he said he would do? How many? I do. And you know what that means? He has a method by which he raises disciples. And I looked at the disciples. I did. The crowd was starving, so were they. The crowd was hot, so were they. Weren't they? Jesus stood among the people in the conditions they were in, teaching and preaching. The disciples were there with him, taking in everything. They stayed up to pray at night while everybody else slept. They were full of anxiety while everybody else was at peace. They had to confront evil while everybody else sat down to eat dinner. The peace of Christ is trusting in the living God to have trust in God, to have full faith in God. That is the peace of Christ, not peace like uh, that we think of. See, if we say, well, we just want peace, then we have defined what peace is. But who's going to let Christ define what that peace is? See, when Christ tells us something like that, it's something that we have to discover. In order to do that, we have to learn to be obedient children, not going after what we want, but surrendering that we may follow Christ to learn what his peace actually is. One time I thought I knew what it was before I knew what it was. I thought having the peace that surpasses all understanding, right? I thought it was going to be, yeah, I'm relaxed when nobody else is wrong. First of all, if it surpasses understanding, you're going to find yourself in situations. Uh-oh. Because if it surpasses understanding, then the truth is you should not be peaceful. Under your conditions. See, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody likes that one. That means you'll have a trust. When trust is broken with everybody else, that means you'll have faith. While your situation will have broken everybody else's faith. That means you're thrust into issues. But you have faith. The peace. The wisdom. The knowledge and the wherewithal to follow Christ in obedience, despite your conditions. See, it has nothing to do with your conditions. And that's the part that throws people off. Because I'll say, well, wait a minute. My life is in shambles. I, I don't have peace. It dresses me out. It does so. Because you're looking to establish what you understand peace is. But if you want the peace of the living God through Christ, if you want the Lord's peace, you have to surrender all your definitions to discover what his peace is. You can't define what the peace of Christ is, and we have not obtained any other type peace. We think we know what peace is by the dictionary. Nope, sorry, that won't work. I was the first one that messed that one up. Imagine yourself in a circumstance 
a circumstance that almost broke you. But you're in that same circumstance. But this time, you're smiling. But this time, you're hopeful. But this time, you're full of faith. Why? Because of the circumstance. It is still rough. It's windy. It's raging. But because of that, now you have an understanding of the Lord. And you're not fearful in the circumstance. You can hear the voice of the Lord in the circumstance. Huh? Wouldn't that be amazing? To understand, to have a comprehension of what the Lord is doing through your circumstance. Now that's having some peace nobody understands. When you can sit there and smile and everybody else is broke down and you say, huh. They say, why are you not worried? Because my father's at work in my life. Thank you very much. Hmm? Because he's doing something in my life. If the Lord were to ever look away from us, we would have the same perks as the world. We would. We'd have everything and more that the world has. We would be a friend of the world. But we're not. And because we're not, while everybody else has peace around you, of the world, we don't. The the disciples in that boat in the middle of a storm, they could have had peace. All they had to do was to have their trust in the Messiah. And they could have rolled back over and went to sleep. But they panicked. And they were scared. Because they could not recognize the Messiah. Now that's a big hint. How can you not recognize the Messiah in the middle of a storm? They thought it was a ghost or something else, didn't they? They did. Why though? How could they recognize him every other time? But in the storm they could not. Because they were in the middle of a trouble. That's why. And when you're in trouble, you often think it came from the devil. They did not identify Christ in the midst of that storm with him. They didn't. They thought it was a ghost. Remember that? They said, oh, he's a ghost. No, it isn't. It's Christ. That's when Peter said, well, if, if you be Christ, then bid me to come out there and I'll come out there. He said, come on out. Come on out. You remember that? They couldn't recognize him. They couldn't do it. When we get in trouble, we misidentify who Christ is so often. Because we only see the circumstances. And it blurs everything else. As soon as you get in trouble, the first thing you do is pray to get out. We, we forget about the scriptures. They get not strained when you go through fiery trials. We're not thinking about that scripture, right? Glory in tribulation. We don't think about that scripture, right? Because if we did, we would understand, wait a minute. I gave my life to Christ. And Christ is my keeper. He's the keeper of my soul. So nothing can happen to me unless Christ is delivering me. Because Christ overcame the world. Christ overcame hell, death, and the grave. Christ has all the keys. He commands all. And if he commands all, he's getting my attention. He's showing me something here. Let me pay attention. See, that's how you can glory in tribulation. Because in the Bible, it tells you what tribulation or what troubles, what they're doing in your life. Now, if the Bible never mentioned that, what troubles were doing in your life, then we could surely say that troubles are from the devil. But because it says what troubles are working in your life, the believer's life, we know where the troubles are coming from. Look back on the troubles that you have had, every single last one. And you tell me which problem did not contain the principles of Christ. You tell me which problem did not produce a delivered you. Because every single problem I've ever been in exposed my own flesh. What about you? What about you? It exposed my own flesh. It worked things nobody else can work. Every single issue exposed my own flesh. It's 
start to see all things, all sorts of things dealing with my flesh. And I said, okay, I get it now. After about, you know, two million times going through the same thing. Oh, I got it now. And as soon as you get it, it's over. It's done. When you really get it, when it really sinks in, when you have grown by it, it's gone. It does not come back again. Then a brand new one comes, doesn't it? A brand new lesson comes. Think of it as school. And your trials and tribulations are tests. Nobody, I haven't heard a student yet that would come into a classroom and say, wow, I can't wait till I take a test. That's not the first thing they say. That's not what they're saying. You know what a test comes around, test anxiety comes with it? We know that. When you believe in the gospel, right, and things are happening in your life, but you're a believer in the gospel, you better believe it's working something. But there's also the in-between. Listen to me. There's some who read the Bible. They love the Lord. But they have not fully accepted the sacrifice upon their own lives. How do you know if that's you? Because you run around with guilt. You say you're not worthy enough. You say you're not this, you're not this. You have a tons of things that you say about yourself. You still have strong desires to do specific things, and then after you do it, you'll say, well, I'm not worth anything. I'm just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right? That's what you'll say. Why is that, though? Because, listen, when you accept the cross and fool, right, then you have accepted that God sent the highest priced thing he could ever sin just for your life. And when you receive that, when you actually receive it upon yourselves, you don't sit there and degrade yourselves anymore. You know that you've been, what, forgiven. Let me tell you something. In the Bible it says, when you know what you have done in accordance with righteousness, you will stand firm. But see, when you don't know, that's when you waver. When you're unsure, because you could have done something, but you didn't, that's when you're shifty. That's when you're rocking too much. Listen, I'll say it again. It's when we could have done something, but we didn't. There's still time. There's still time to commit fully. There is. There's still time. You, do you guys know? There was a time I did not commit fully. Did I believe in Christ? You better believe it. I even had knowledge of the Lord. I even had these I had gifts of the Lord, but I did not fully receive the cross by myself. As a consequence of that, guess what happened? I stayed on the outside. I was on the outside. I really was. Strange thing, huh? You stay on the outskirts. Because you know, you know who you are. You know, there were times when there were spiritual attacks, you could say, confrontations. And with all that, still, And receive the whole thing. There were times when I knew God would help everybody else. I didn't know if he'd help me or not. Why? Because I did not fully embrace what the Lord did for me. When you fully embrace what the Lord has done for you, that's when the change comes. But if you continue to say, I'm not worth it, I'm too broken, I'm too dark, I'm too dirty, I'm too this, but you believe the Lord can work in somebody else's life, but when it comes to your own life, you'll say, I don't know if he'll do that or not, probably not. What makes a person say that? I'll tell you what makes a person say that. It's when we have not fully received the cross upon ourselves. Time for people to say, you know what, Christ died for me. 
Christ died for me. See, that's what people aren't saying. That's what they're not affirming internally, is Christ died for me. So when you're out there doing something crazy, and you catch yourself, and you say, Lord, forgive me, guess what? Christ died for you. You'll believe it upon everybody else, but when it comes to you, that's your line. No. You cannot deny the cross in your own life and say that he will give it to everybody else. See, you're going to find out quickly that to deny the cross is to deny the cross. The Lord does not want you powerless. The Lord does not want you all tangled up in this worldly stuff. He desires that you be free. But you cannot be free until you say, Christ died for me. When you say that and know that, guess what happens? That's when you really begin to repent. Because you say, nope, Christ died for me, buddy. Lord, I'll turn all of it. I'm, I'm turning everything away you bring up to my mind. Nobody will force you. It's not anything you have to give up. See, the, when you want to stay out in the world and do things, that's when it's hard. You think you've got to give up stuff. But when you accept the cross upon your own life, and you say, Christ died for me, a desire rises within you where you want to be in alignment. And when sin comes around, you say, you better not come near me. That's what you'll say. Instead of struggling with the sin, you'll say, you better not come over here. Don't you defile anything over here. That's when you take authority. When you say Christ died for me, you're going to start taking authority. And when you take authority, that's when you stop letting spirits slide ease in and out of your life. Because you'll, you'll say enough is enough because Christ died for me. Do you know how many people in the body of Christ have not said that? They've not said that. They've not said Christ died for me. They continue to say, yes, Christ died for you. Christ died for you over there. The Lord will heal you of that over there. He's going to fix this in your life. But when it comes to that individual, they say, I don't know. I don't know. Just stop saying, I don't know. Or you have to, listen, just say it. Christ died for me. You led everything in your environment. That is of the Spirit. Whether it's in darkness or light. And you let it know. Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for me. See, by that acknowledgement, then you know he rose to grant you everything. Listen, he rose with power authority, full dominion. And because you said Christ died for me, guess what? Then you're resurrected with him. And if you're resurrected with him, and you're standing in him, then there is no darkness that has power over you anymore. Do you hear me? See, darkness can have power so long as you will not stand within Christ. You cannot stand within Christ and refuse to say Christ died for me. But once you say Christ died for me, then your steps are ordered of the Lord. See, that's your first statement of compliance and acceptance. is to say that Jesus of Nazareth died for me. That changes Everything. Do you know those spirits that influence your life? They do not want you to say that. They want you to feel like you're on the outside. They want you to have some sort of weird understanding that you're not a partaker of the goodness, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's a lie. That's a lie. 
you would never believe in him. If God did not give you to his son and his son to you, it's impossible for a person to believe in Jesus of Nazareth unless the Father give you to the Son. Do, do you guys understand that? You cannot on your own believe in Jesus. That is a testament unto itself that the Father gave you to the Son to be kept, not lost. To be raised, not diminished. To be set at liberty. Never to remain in bondage. To be healed and not broken. Do you understand that? So what happens to the person that never acknowledges that Christ died for them? They stay broken. If they're blind, they'll continue to be blind. If they're lame, they'll continue to be lame. If they're deaf, they'll continue to be deaf. They'll never experience that full deliverance they're yearning for and God knows you're yearning for it you need that deliverance well guess what there's a Messiah who can grant it he can grant your deliverance it's, we got into a conversation about faith which normally happens right I, for some reason I end up in these conversations about faith and somebody said you know what I've received the Lord, and, and I, I said he died for me. But, but why is it? I have no authority. I said, do you understand authority? Well, yeah. I said, well, tell me. That person said, I'm supposed to be able to rebuke a demon, and it leaves the first time. I said, that's right. He said, but I can't do it. I said, that's right. He thought I didn't hear him. He said, but I can't do it. I said, that's right. You cannot. You can't do anything. But the Lord has already done it. You're trying to do it by your own personal power as though you got the, you don't have the power. You are joint heir with Christ. Step into Christ. And by his authority, everything must vamoosh. Not by yours, by his. See how that works? It is Christ who overcame. How can one have authority outside of Christ? They can't. It'll fail every single time. But when you step into Christ, and you say, wait a minute, he died for me. He died for me. And because he is in me, I can now do it through Christ who strengthens me. That means that authority is about to work. Hmm? But when you try to do something by yourself, you're trying to believe that you can do it. My friend, I never have to believe I can do anything. But I believe Christ can do all things. And that's my solution. I don't need to believe in me. I need to believe in Christ. It is by his authority. See, to rebuke a demon is not to say it. Lord, have mercy. Well, somebody gets out. You think saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus is going to make a demon go away? Huh? -uh. Because you can rebuke a demon, yet have the same desires for that specific demon. Therefore, you did not rebuke it. You just said that you did. When you rebuke something, stand against it. A rebuke is an action word. That's an action word. You stand against it. If I stand against something, I will not ever allow it to operate within me. That's a rebuke. And when it can no longer operate within you, guess what? It's broken from operation. Who strengthens you? Christ. And you can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. You cannot do it yourselves. But in Christ. So 
instead of having faith in yourself to do something, have faith that the Lord will do it. And faith will do it. How do you find yourself within Christ when you absolutely agree with him? That's how. You want to go step into Christ, into that place of rest? You know that peace that surpasses all understanding? Is that not the same thing as entering into his rest? Hmm? Because when you stand in Christ, it already tells us how. Obedience. When you obey, you are in Christ. Obedience. When you're disobedient, you're not in Christ, no matter how much you claim it. And when you are in Christ, when you obey his sayings, what did the Lord say? He and the Father would make their abode in you and sup with you. My, my. If they live within you, there's no breaching of that authority. If the Son and the Father are in you, the Son is the Word of God, and the Father is in you, how by way of a spirit you're full, you're complete. Do you understand that's completeness? To have both the Spirit and the Word is completeness. Now you're fully functional. Now you're fully functional. See, that spirit will cause you to get up. The word decrees. The word will make, unmake, move or unmove. And the spirit within you will lead you to all truth. It'll give you strength to stand up. Stamina to keep going. It'll grant you what you need. To continue with the word, Christ. That means you're not operating with your own engine, but with an extremely powerful engine that never stops. Now tell me that's not a place of rest. Tell me that's not a place of peace. Hmm? Isn't it so peaceful when it works out? Not so peaceful when there's no authority from you. No power being exercised to overcome darkness. The absence of darkness is light. And in that light you'll find liberty and peace and fulfillment and joy. And it all begins with an acknowledgement when you say Christ died for me. Hmm? When you obey him, no other spirit can enter into you. Nothing can come back. Nothing will overpower. That's the beginning of your liberty. It is quite impactful. Once those things are defined, then you define your new direction. Why? Because the Lord will grant you something you've been missing. And when you have that, you're sealed. You're sealed against everything in the darkness. And when that happens, that's when you accept fully your destiny. See, a lot of people don't like to accept that they're predestined. I'll tell you something. If we knew what the Lord had in store for us, not one of us would want our own dream. 
We would not want what we're dreaming of. We would actually want what the Lord has for us. He's the only one that knows what will fulfill you. Many of you have tried to fill that empty void was everything you could find, and it did not work. You thought it would work. It's kind of like, it's kind of like saying, you know, I, this house would look so much better if I had that item. And then you go get that item, and two days later, you're saying that wasn't it. Or you have a taste for something. You say, well, I just need some so-and-so. I have a taste for so-and-so. You go get the so-and-so. You eat the whole thing, and it does not satisfy See, the Lord can give you the one thing that will satisfy everything. And what I'm telling you is that you're yearning for something in the heart of hearts that nothing has fulfilled. And I'm telling you, Christ knows exactly what it is. What you're truly yearning for can never be found outside of Christ. And you will not make a mistake in misidentifying the moment when it is fulfilled. See, I know something, maybe you don't. I know that when a person finds a specific thing, if you're looking for something in your house, that means you lost it, right? You go to somebody's house, and they're not looking for anything. They know where everything is. How about that? They found what they were looking for. When you find what you're looking for, you stop searching in all these other places. When you actually obtain what you're looking for, your search is over. But if you don't have what you're looking for, you can open up every book you can get a hold of, every video you can click on. You're going to open everything in hopes of finding something, some clue to something you're looking for. And again, when you have found it, you're never searching anymore. Father knows what the ultimate question is, and it must be yours. Do you believe that in Christ, is your fullness. That's something you have to ask yourself. I can only hope and pray that you'll go and look directly in Christ in full alignment. I know where you'll find what you're looking for. But you have to make that choice. It's your choice to go or not go. But I would ask you to consider this. You've looked everywhere else and you're still looking, which means if you're still looking, that means you did not find it. Being in Christ is very different from compliance, from knowing about Him. Being in Christ is being predestined. Being in Christ is having authority. Being in Christ. That's all too often the missing element. Now it's your, your turn. See, darkness does not want you fully in Christ. Because it will lose all attachments to your life. They're broken by Christ. Instantly by Christ. I mean instantly. But do you see how it takes a surrender? And listen again, again, if you want life to be something you have to find, then how can you ever obtain what you're predestined for? Think about it. Too many people are chasing what they want out of life. They're trying to make that happen. When you do that, you forfeit the fact that you're predestinated. When you want what the Lord has for you, then you step into him and trust him by way of direction.
He will lead you to the still waters. He will restore your soul. Hmm? That means arrows that fly by noonday will not come near you. No trouble is going to come near your dwelling. That's what it means. And people who live their life that way, they don't have fear of what's coming. They know what's coming, but they have no fear of it. They still go through things, but they go through it with joy and a joy that nobody can understand. And they grow much by the smallest thing. Much. You'll notice of those people, they're not resistors of the word, but they truly comprehend it. They love the word because they can see it. And not one of you is destined. None of you who love the Lord are destined for condemnation, destruction, or otherwise. You're destined, predestinated for only a high position, a royal priesthood, royal priesthood, for full authority, vessels of the living word of God. Vessels of power, of deliverance, of peace and liberty. All those things found within Christ. That's what you're predestined for. But again, listen, because tonight we're talking about identifying what you want out of life. And I'll say it again. If you have defined what you want out of life, how then can you accept what the Lord has for you? And I'll say it, what the Lord has for you will fulfill everything about you. What you go and find yourselves is not going to work. I know that by way of the word of God. See, if you do it your way, you're going to be forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Have you ever have you ever seen somebody run around with a lot of the knowledge of the living God, yet they get every problem in the world? Have you ever seen anybody like that? How can that be so? I mean, you talk to the person, it's almost like talking to Charlie Brown. Whoa, they got the war is me syndrome. No joy, no optimism, none of those things. Little trust, but they know everything in the word of God, and not one thing is working for them. That's not who we are to be. We're not to be that way. We are to be victorious, fully delivered, and very impactful. You're a threat to the kingdom of Satan, to the beast kingdom. You're a threat, not a target, a threat. Once you stand within Christ, you become a threat. To all of darkness, even to Satan himself, you're a threat. You're his overseer. Do you know that? These are not the days of Job. They are not. No, no. These are days of fulfillment. These are the days of destiny. Not the days when they talked about it. These are the days that the prophets desired to be. They desired to see you. They envied you. Don't you know this? Because you're the ones that lived after the Messiah, the ones that did not see him. Remember Jesus said, he said, you believe me because you've seen me. But blessed are they who believe and have not seen. My goodness, blessed are they who believe and have not seen. That's you. That's you. Hmm? That's you. Now, how many want to get to that place? 
That's what I want to know. How many want to get to that place? Oh, no, because we're not dropping a ball here. How many want to get to that place? How many want to get to that place where you're actually in Christ and you know you're actually in Christ? Forget about the, the steps to how to get there. Forget about that. How many want to get there? Because the Lord sent people in this world with the word of God not to tell you how to get there, but to demonstrate it. To see it through. Didn't the Lord see it through? Yes, he did. So why would he send people who won't see it through? <laughs> Timing is always everything. It is. So I say, then, let's, let's get there then. How about that? Let's get there then. Hmm? Nothing is stopping us. Let's get there then. Piece by piece, step by step. Let's get there then. Folks, I don't want to keep you guys up all night. I want you guys to contemplate about life, about what you want out of life. Because the next step is a biblical step that the Lord advised everybody to take. Hmm. Somebody said the world has us chasing everything but the Lord. That's right. That's right. Some people just want the answer. But they keep forgetting about the Messiah. I have lots of answers. And it never helped me. Answers don't help. Because you find yourself in the same predicament with the answers. Right? It's kind of like if you, suppose you had a foreclosure coming. And you say, well, Lord, I, I, look, I just, uh, what I need, I need the foreclosure money. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you every dime that goes to your foreclosure. So you get, you get the money. Listen, you get the money. You pay it. Your house is not foreclosed. But it just so happens you're one day away from billing of everything else and you don't have money to pay that either. So you get the money for foreclosure. But tomorrow your lights and your water and everything else is being shut off. But how bad is that? And your car is being repoed. But you got your foreclosure fixed. See, that's what happens. That's what happens when we make our plan, listening to all these voices in the world, we get the one thing and forego everything else. Something will always blindside you. But with the Lord, everything is complete. And it's always complete in a way that you can't fully comprehend, so you'll never take credit for it. It's like having everything paid off. That's what it's like with the Lord, right? Imagine you ask the Lord for one thing, but he gives you far more. Did you know in the Word of God it states... God is able to do above and beyond what you're able to ask or think. So if you're not able to ask or to even think of it, then what the Lord has in store for you is far above what you have the ability to comprehend. And what he's doing. You're going to know what he's doing, right? You're going to know what he's done in hindsight. This is what no none of you should ever do, right? Right now, we don't live in our own future right now. But imagine in the future. Let me, let me give you a story. A guy is in, he's in Missouri. Right? Every day he wakes up, something breaks in his house. He starts feeling a certain way, like he should move, but he ignores it. And he says, nothing is going to make me move. I'm going to just fix it up. So he goes outside. And his whole patio falls into the ground, the sinkhole. And again, he gets this unction, move. And so he says, no, I'm going to fix up everything. Nothing is going to force me out of my dream home. So one day, the biggest tornado in history comes. And it destroys an entire city. 
and his house is right in the epicenter of it. It just utterly destroys that. It destroys all of his resources, all of his field, everything. It destroys everything, takes everything. And it just so happens they need verification of certain items so he can get insurance, but it destroyed that too. He lost all his animals. And let's throw in some more. Let's say he lost some of his family members. In that man's case, how many more times did the Lord have to give him some sort of unction to move because it was coming? Hear me out on this. There are so many occasions the Lord will speak to us but because of what we want. We think he is the voice of darkness and not the voice of light. Why? Because you cannot hear the Lord when you have fixated your mind on what you want. The world teaches that you have to go out and get what you want. The world has that teaching, not your father. Your father has something for you. The world does not. The world continues to tell you, you've got to forge your own future. I've seen people put up a home every other year from tornadoes knocking them down to the point where they have gone broke. They said they're tired out. They can't do it again. Why would you put a home back in the same place every single time? Some of those people in California, they continue to rebuild no matter what hits. But what if one day in truth, that whole, the whole West Coast is gone. They can never say God did not send warning. I told somebody a long time ago, I said, watch, watch the weather. Wherever the weather hits, an extraordinary thing will consume it. Wherever it hits and continues to hit, that's a, that's a warning going out. Now, people, Satan is slick. Right? As soon as a storm comes, you hear people talking about his harp or his this or his that, as though God has no ability, nor has a desire to do anything like that. They're doing exactly what the Word of God says they would do. In the Bible, it says that people would say God will not do good nor evil, which means all this stuff that's happening is by chance. That's what they continue to say these days. Or oh, it's just, you know, that just happens. That's not God. It just happens. They're doing the exact thing the Bible said they would do. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. And for those who continue to think it's harp, you might want to look again. There's a clear message going out. Who's going to get it? Right before those California fires, all sorts of mishaps were happening in California. And it just so happens, did not have a discussion with the uh, select two people in COT. Right before those fires. Because I told them, I said, listen, these, this stuff that keeps coming, right? They're just not coming because of harp or something like that. Pay attention. And sure enough, the fires devoured. Shootings happen in those places. A mass shooting. I'm telling you right now. Guys, you remember where I told you guys about that little dream, right? That dream with the on, I saw on the tablet, and the people were ready to do something, and and you know people kind of just treated that nonchalantly. Do you know that was that was shared? And when they looked, they found something, but they didn't find all of it. They didn't, and all the dates with nines in it are coming up. Why? Hard for people to believe in anything like that. Right? Nonsense. Folks, just watch. Just watch. But most importantly, determine what you want your life to be. Didn't matter if you're 190. Determine it. Figure that out. And have an understanding that if you're predestined, that part of your life is surrendered. 
this is a good day, good time for the Lord to lead you beside the still waters. Not the raging waters, but the still waters. It's a good time for that. But again, if we're if our minds are cluttered with what we want to do, all too often we nullify the voice of the living God. We will not pay attention to his voice because we're so fixated on ours. All right, guys, I'm not going to hold you. I'm going to say God bless everybody, all of you out there. And we'll post our follow-up to this one, this midnight hour, or the next midnight hour. Be at peace. Listen, be within Christ, too. And remember, listen, folks, remember. Remember last time we had the midnight hour, and I told everybody was to forgive everything. Right? Remember something. Remember. Say it.